Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 85th session of the MedAI Group Exchange Sessions. And this week, we have Jason Jiang from um, Arizona State University here with us to speak about their massive mammography data set. Um, Jason is a third year PhD student at ASU um, School of Computing and Augmented, uh, Augmented Intelligence, and he's advised by Dr. Edmond Banerjee. His primary research interests are in using generative models to handle data imbalance problems in classification tasks, but he also focuses on the application and deployment of um, these models in healthcare. So thanks so much, Jason, for joining us today. And I guess before we start, um, how would you like to take questions? Would you prefer uh, the end or in between? Yeah, just please feel free to interrupt whenever you want. Um, it's fairly loose, so uh, more questions, the better. Awesome. Okay, so I guess uh, let's try to have like a good uh, audience participation. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Jason. Okay, well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so my name is Jason Jung, um, and I'll be kind of presenting uh, the massive data set that we uh, published a few, about a year or two ago. Um, it's called the Emory Breast Imaging Dataset, or Embed, a racially diverse granular data set of 3.4 million screening and diagnostic mammographic images. Um, so I guess at first I wanted to kind of thank and kind of mention the uh, the all of these tags here. So uh, I have collaborations and I guess uh, association with the Mayo Clinic. Obviously, I met the ASU uh, School of Engineering, and then um, it's the Emory data set. So I'd like to thank Emory University as well as the Hitty Lab, which we were both uh, previously in and still collaborating with. Um, so I guess with this talk, I would hope to kind of answer these key questions for you guys. And then hopefully um, you can use this data set in whatever task you would like. But first I would like to kind of answer, you know, uh, why do we need another mammography data set? There's a lot of mammography uh, images and data sets out there, but why do we need another one? Um, what does it take to kind of create a huge database like this? Um, what are some of the key characteristics uh, of this data set? And how can you access this data set? So <clears throat> again, why do we need another mammography data set? Um, well, one, uh, breast cancer detection is uh, one of the most common applications of deep learning and radiology, um, along with like chest x-rays and stuff like that. And according to the American Cancer Society um, and the SEER uh, database, the earlier the detection, the better survival rate for the patient. So you can see right here, the localized, um, which again, they don't do the whole um, early to late staging. They kind of do this local, regional, and distant um, staging groups. And for SEER, again, localized is kind of like the earlier detection, which has a 99% five-year survival rate. Um, regional, it drops down to 86, which still is decent. And then distant, when it gets a little bit more metastatic, it drops down way lower to 30%. <clears throat> and at the bottom here, I'm just showing um, <clears throat> kind of the PubMed search, uh, I guess, trend of uh, mammography and breast cancer detection uh, papers in PubMed. And you can see, I mean, obviously in 1976, I don't think they had any deep learning methods, but um, you can see in the 2000s or so, uh, it starts ramping up. And now in the last, I'd say like five to six years, there's been consistently at least um, <clears throat> two to 300 papers on just mem uh, breast cancer detection alone. And it, like a quick Google search, I think this morning showed like about like 400,000 papers on it. So you can see it's a high interest uh, subject. <clears throat> so. Oh, um, I Jason, I think we have a question. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, previous slide. So what exactly is the difference between localized, regional, and uh, distant? Okay, sure. So the difference between the three are localized is essentially the um, <clears throat> the mass or the lesion is uh, very, uh, I guess, tightly bound, or I guess, uh, I, I don't know exactly how to call it, but the margins, it's it doesn't seem like the cancer is spreading that much. So it's very, I guess, as it says, localized. 
Um, regional means that there's some infiltration um, away from the like the initial site. So it's like starting to uh, grow bigger and like uh, go into other places. And I believe distant means uh, it started to invade the lymph nodes and even become metastatic, if that answers your question. Okay, cool. And I'll keep the chat on, on the side just so um, you guys can ask any questions. <clears throat> yeah, and it's a little bit different because yeah, I kind of forgot about this, but the SEER has a weird um, reporting rate for these localized regional and distance because we usually, obviously, um, if you work in cancer, um, do like stage one, two, three, et cetera. So it's different. Okay, so again, there's already a lot of uh, breast imaging data sets. So again, there's the uh, Dream Challenge uh, digital mammography data set that has about 640,000 uh, images uh, from about eight, I believe it's actually 84,000 uh, women, all classified as either benign or malignant uh, mammographies. Uh, there's the CBIS uh, DDSM data set. Again, not the largest, uh, but again, there's 2,620 um, scanned film mammograms uh, with lesion annotations, which is great. And then <clears throat> I think the largest of the three, which is the uh, Optimum uh, Mammography Imaging Database set, data set, I should say, <clears throat> it has uh, three about 3 million images from about 170,000 women. And it has a lot of information such as uh, lesion level ROIs and uh, certified pathologic outcomes. So, um, you know, why do we need another, another one? Well, one- I have a quick <clears throat> question, Jason, about mm -hmm. one of these. Um, so are the multiple images basically from like a single uh, time or is it basically longitudinal as well? Like, do we have multiple um, like instances of the same woman like over the years? Yeah, so I, th uh, I believe uh, for the Dream as well as the Optum, and I'm not exactly sure about the DDSM, but all of these data sets, they do have some longitudinal uh, exams. So um, one mammographic image can have, uh, I believe at least four views. So there's like, RCC, LCC, MLO, uh, uh, I believe there's a bunch more actually that I, don't, I can't even remember. So again, even at one instance, uh, you can have at least like four to six uh, images per patient. And then again, following through longitudinally, um, the patient can have multiple exams, which again, can make another six to seven and there can be a lot. So that's why you can kind of go from this 127,000 uh, to 3 million. Good, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> so again, we have a lot of these images. And again, um, whether or not you want to mix and match data sets is kind of on your own. But um, some of the challenges of these data sets are one, the dream data set, uh, only 0.2% of the cases are actually uh, malignant. And there's actually no regions of interest that you can actually uh, use. So it's really more of a classification or detection problem, not a, I guess, um, not detection, sorry, but like you can't localize the uh, malignancy. Uh, the DDSM data set, although it's good, um, nobody really uses film mammograms anymore. Um, most everybody uses uh, full field digital mammograms. And then uh, Optum uh, doesn't have any like semantic imaging descriptors. So what I mean by that is like kind of these examples here where, um, semantic imaging descriptor will kind of say, yes, yeah, so well, it's a well-defined homogeneous oval mass with uh, no architectural distortion, or if it's bad, it would be like ill-defined homogeneous irregular mass with uh, architectural distortion. So these are kind of like the descriptors that we're trying to, uh, well, it helps in um, uh, classification classification tasks or even um, going from you know images to describe describing it um, through uh, large language models or anything like that. So Jason, this large data set, uh, optimum mammography, this doesn't include radiology reports, right? Because radiology reports, I assume, would have these and semantic descriptions. Yes. So they don't have radiology reports included. Yeah, no radiology reports. Okay. 
Okay. So again, and kind of mentioned already a little bit, um, uh, most of the publicly released data sets are pretty ethnically and racially homogeneous. Um, and you can kind of say the same for almost all of the data sets out there. Um, it's fairly uh, homogeneous in the sense that it's the Western or US population that is mostly you know, heterosexual white males. Um, and obviously that can lead to some sort of biases. And that's not great because again, in these mammography data sets or these homogeneous mammography data sets, um, African-American and other minority patients are severely underrepresented, even though they also have the worst prognosis uh, in the medical system. Um, but the unique opportunity and kind of one of the big reasons why we started this uh, data set is that uh, Emory actually has about 45% of the population at, as uh, African-American. And so we had this ability to have an almost at least uh, black and white patient uh, balanced data set. And so we wanted to uh, put it out there essentially. Uh, one general question. Are you getting ethnicity from which report? Yes, uh, so ethnicity, and I'll kind of mention this on the later slides as well, is that it's the self-reported race in the uh, EHR. Um, so again, um, there's no like genetic tests or anything like that, or like a 21 and me sort of thing that we're doing, but yeah, it's the self-reported race. Uh, wait, so radiology report. Uh, I don't think it's a radiology report. I believe it is a um, self-reported race. So the patient kind of uh, writes down what ethnicity they are in their EHR records uh, when they get admitted. Okay, cool. Okay, so now that we know um, kind of the reason why we wanted to create this data set, um, what does it take to create a data set like this? Obviously, uh, you know, 3.6 million images with a lot of these patients, um, it can take a lot of effort. Um, obviously, a quick shout out to the Hitty Lab and uh, everybody that helped. Um, so it takes, you know, a huge team of scientists, data analysts, residents, per physicians, all kind of collaborating and working in parallel to help. And obviously the Hitty Lab people are people, hopefully you guys are familiar with Iman in the middle. Uh, Judy, obviously pretty famous in that racial bias area. And then obviously Dr. Hari Trevetti, who led this uh, work. But <clears throat> um, so... What we did is obviously initially for with any you know sort of data set or any sort of uh, uh, patient cohort selection, you need an inclusion external exclusion criteria. And so we first selected patients um, that had either a screening or diagnostic mammogram from January 2023, or, or sorry, 2013 to December 2020. And this was across four institutional hospitals um, in the Emory network. And then um, obviously women that were over 18 and had at least one uh, mammogram in the PAX system were included and the exclusion criteria were under 18. Um, so very broadly speaking, this is kind of the workflow or I guess how we got the final database. So there was the imaging branch, which again, going from a uh, you know, couple hundred thousand uh, patients with a lot of exams, um, as well as the MagView database with, you know, structured imaging descriptors and, you know, out of all of the findings that were uh, given or reported. And then the pathology reports that we were kind of double checking with. And then obviously clinical data of like the demographics that were either self-reported or any sort of like history or EHR information that we could get from there. And so that's how we created the uh, data set. So I guess I'll start with the imaging side. Um, so again, uh, there was uh, 281,000 screening and 83,000 uh, diagnostic exams. And of those, uh, about 52% were screening, uh, sorry, 52% of the screening were 2D only, and about 80% of the diagnostic were 2D only. Um, the, other, the rest were actually 2D with uh, digital breast 
uh, tomosynthesis images or synthetic 2D images. And these synthetic 2D images were kind of generated from these uh, digital, or sorry, DPTs. Um, okay. And then, so all of the mammograms were in DICOM format, and then we used Niffler, um, which is a in-house uh, open source pipeline um, to extract the images and go from there. Oh, I have a quick question here. Mm -hmm. so do even the screening mammograms have um, ROIs or is that only for the diagnostic ones? That's actually a fun question. It's actually the opposite. Um, <clears throat> so the what we found, at least when we were creating this, this data set, I would say about 90 to 95% of the uh, ROIs, or even more than that, actually, were burned in into the screening mammograms. And once the uh, physician or whoever it was screened for it, found um, a suspicious area, that's when patients went on for diagnostic um, imaging. I see. And so this, <clears throat> excuse me. So the ROI was actually like manually done by the physician or is this like an automatic, um, automatic blood or something like that? All manual. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so all of these were, again, all of these were just like standard practice sort of stuff. Um, I'll also kind of mention later on that it was kind of interesting because all of these uh, ROI selections were obviously just like, you know, those like elliptical click and drop sort of things. Um, and then, but the thing is, the ROIs were actually burned into this as a screen save, not into the DICOM information. So mm -hmm. there were some challenges uh, that I'll mention in the next slide about how we need to go from these like screen saves with the burned in ROIs to the actual um, ROIs in the full mammogram. Got it, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> um, so as mentioned, uh, there were kind of four main challenges uh, uh, in creating this data set. So one was the differentiation between the different imaging images. Um, so again, similar to the film versus digital mammogram problem. You don't wanna train something on a 2D digital uh, mammogram to DBT or even synthetic 2D images. Uh, again, you can try, but again, there's uh, some, some distribution shift that you can expect. Um, two, differentiation between the standard images and the special views. <clears throat> so what I mean by special views are actually like spot compression images, uh, magnification paddles uh, or procedural views that actually happen when um, they're trying to do biopsies or even wire localizations. So again, those are another like unique set of images that we don't want to confuse or at least have tags for so that you can filter through them if needed. Three, and I kind of mentioned this already, um, extracting the burned in RIs from screen saves. So again, um, these uh, ROIs were not saved in like DICOM format. So you couldn't just kind of extract them out very simply. We needed to first look at the screen save images, check if there was an ROI burned in, and then finally um, <clears throat> use the, or get the ROI detect detected and localized, and then kind of extrapolate that to the actual mammogram that it got the, the um, um, screen save from. And finally, um, <clears throat> extracting breast tissue uh, from the spot mag or the, or sorry, spot compression or the magnification paddles. Because again, we thought that that was a useful data because again, the reason why they're using spot compression or magnification paddles is because they suspect something within that region. So <clears throat> um, oh. image wise. Jason, oh, can you yeah. give us a quick primer on what spot compression and, and magnification paddles, or maybe I missed this. Oh yeah, um, I'll kind of show the images later, but oh, okay. um, essentially it's one of those, it's it's like a paddle that's trying to flatten an area uh, of the breast. So I think a standard mammogram, you have these like two kind of big, uh, I guess paddles in parallel kind of squeezing the breast so that you can um, quote unquote flatten out the breast mm -hmm. as much as possible. Um, versus the spot compression and uh, magnification paddles are additions to that so that you can even, um, I guess, flatten the area or magnify that area even more. Um, 
And I'll show you some um, examples of these uh, later on. Okay. And I guess, will you also be talking about the resolution of these images later? Um, if yes, I'll just wait for it. Or if not, um, like, yeah, I, can, I mean, I can touch on the resolution. So the screen saves or um, I believe like uh, up to like about a thousand by like 800 ish. Um, so again, not, I mean, pretty high quality, but not as high quality as actual full digital mammograms, which can be, you know, in the three to four K uh, resolutions. Got it. Thank you. And so um, for the imaging side, at least, uh, which I guess I'm a, a lot more familiar with, the workflow kind of went like this, where we have all of the images pulled or uh, pulled by Niffler. And then we use, we have to first check the image type just to set, check if it's a screen save image, 2D, C view, which is again, synthetic, or DBT, which is like uh, essentially a digital mammogram uh, CT, if that makes sense to you. And then from there, we needed to use all four of the images to either select the standard views so that we can get the ROI extraction and mapped, or check if it's a special view, and then go through another small pipeline of getting the breast tissue in that paddle area. So as for uh, image type um, identification, um, we actually used uh, DICOM metadata. So Using the series description, view position, and the image laterality, we could tell um, if the image was either 2D screen save, C view, or DBT, as well as um, if it was the left or right breast, as well as uh, the different views. So again, RCC, uh, LCC, MLO, all of these different views. We could extract that from the DICOM metadata. And again, there were, <clears throat> it was very consistent. So at least from the, uh, a lot of the double, triple, even quadruple checks that we did, uh, we didn't see any errors, at least in the DICOM metadata usage. Um, <clears throat> so view identification. So again, uh, essentially we initially trained a classifier, um, like a very simple like VGG11 um, to classify if the image was a 2D or regular 2D image or a C view or DBT. Um, it was working well. Um, I would say, I believe it was getting an accuracy of like 98%-ish. But then the thing is, if we're looking at about 3 million images, um, even a 2% two, two difference could mean tens of thousands of images uh, not being able to be used or at least misclassified. Um, so we were trying to see if we could, in parallel, we were trying to see if we could also still use uh, DICOM metadata to see um, if you can actually figure out which one is which. And I somehow happened to find one tag. Um, it was a private tag and it was view code sequence, view modifier code sequence, code meaning that actually had a tag for essentially spot mag or no spot mag. Um, that actually allowed us to kind of filter out the special views and then go from there. And then <clears throat> again, finally, the ROI coordinate mapping, um, as mentioned before, because the ROIs were in these burned in screen saves, they were not in the same resolution of the full mammograms. We needed to one, uh, find the uh, screen saves that actually had ROIs, two, find the matching mammograms that had uh, of the screen saves, three, localize the ROIs in the screen save and then map it to the original. Um, and so it was kind of a process, but it seemed to work fairly well. Um, so how we did that was one, there would be one screen save because again, with the DICOM metadata, it would tell you if it was a screen save or not. And so of the screen saves for each of the patients, we would just ex essentially get the screen save, um, flip it and check which one had the greatest uh, structural similarity index. Um, so as you can see, this is RCC and RCC. So you could tell these are actually the same image. So we have the highest uh, SSIM here. Um, I've, clearly these are different images. This is RCC and I believe this is MLO. And you could tell that you know <laughs> it's a bad similarity. Um, and in the middle, you have actually the RCC, but this is LCC. So it's the opposite or the, the 
the other breasts, I should say. And you can see that it has a high similarity, but again, not as similar as the uh, true mammogram or the mammogram that it maps to. Um, <clears throat> the reason why we actually did the flipping and tried to see which one had the uh, best SSIM is that uh, a lot of these images, um, or these screen save, as I should say, um, were kind of flipped irregularly. So even though uh, it's a RCC or LCC, and even though the breast should be on the other side, um, the screen saves kind of push it all on onto one side or kind of mix them up. So we kind of had to check uh, both of them. Um, and so essentially what we did was uh, train a uh, efficient debt B0 um, to one, uh, detect the ROIs. And so you can see it's a faint outline, but this is a screen saves where we see the ROI here. And then from there, uh, we get the bounding box for the ROI. We check the extracted ROI. And you can see in the screen save resolution, um, the image is fairly granular and like pixelated. And obviously, the ROI is like burned in. Um, from there, we just essentially get the ratio between the screen save and the uh, original mammogram that matches. And then we get the actual patch that we want. And so you can see from here to here, we have the same features of these, I believe, calcifications. Um, but in the full mammogram that, again, has like 3x, 4x uh, resolution, um, the quality is a lot better, or at least the extracted ROI is better. So uh, I guess this goes back to Nandita's question about the special views. Um, so these are, this is, I believe, the compression um, yeah, the magnification uh, paddles. Uh, so again, this is kind of pushing the uh, breast even more so that you can uh, see the structure a lot more. So you can see at least, I mean, maybe it's a little bit better to see here. Um, the breast, part of the breast that is not under the, under the uh, magnification, it's a lot more uh, dense, if that makes sense, in the view of the x-ray. So by compressing it and allowing it to be more flat, uh, there's less things you know, in the way of the x-ray so that you can see a little bit more detail. And this uh, on the right is the spot mat compression. Um, so again, it's another paddle, but it's kind of round. Um, and again, it serves the same purpose uh, again to kind of uh, magnify or flatten the spot so that you can get higher resolution. Um, and again, as mentioned before, because I guess just purely for the fact that um, asking for a spot mag uh, kind of implies that there's some suspicion in that tissue area, uh, we wanted to extract that. And so we actually had um, some collaborators from, I believe, KSU um, that used um, some intensity-based methods to kind of figure out, well, these are all metal, so you can see that the intensities are quite bright. And even though it's round, again, the intensity is still quite bright. And so they use those intensity filters to kind of extract the images from the inside. Um, <clears throat> so then uh, next, there's the uh, pathology and kind of like the structure report start or stuff. And so what we did was um, we consulted with like breast pathologists as well as uh, oncologists to identify 56 of the most common findings in breast, breast pathology reports um, within the in-house taxonomy. Uh, and the abnormalities were kind of divided into seven, I guess, general or I guess bigger uh, severity groups, which is uh, invasive cancer, which includes, you know, kind of all of these cancers, uh, non-invasive cancer, uh, high risk situations, uh, borderline, benign, uh, negative or even non-breast cancer uh, cancers, I guess. And so um, in MagView, uh, the pathological information um, was used uh, from the structural uh, structured reports, I should say. And we use that as the uh, main key essentially to label these images. Um, so for example, um, in a structured report, um, if the outcome was uh, specified as like ductal carcinoma in situ with flat epithelial uh, atypia, um, then it was 
encoded as in situ cancer with high lesion or high risk lesion, I should say. Um, and then the, yeah, so that was kind of it. Um, and then I think I kind of showed, uh, if I can go back to the other slide, I kind of showed we had this pathology reports that were free text reports. And so what we did for the free text reports was that, um, that was kind of our secondary um, check where um, we re use the uh, free text reports uh, through a trained uh, transform-based character level BERT to classify uh, the report into one of the seven categories. Um, it actually did very well. Uh, it had an overall F1 score of like 95% um, and classifying reports uh, of 96 or 97%, uh, even for the worst pathology group. And um, although this is a great check, again, um, the initial and the primary labeling was done all manually versus um, this is kind of like a secondary check slash secondary project trying to make a model that can kind of automatically uh, use the free text reports to classify uh, into one of these seven categories. Um, and again, finally, uh, clinical data, we got it from uh, EHRN self-report self-reported intake forms. So again, um, that's kind of people saying their ethnicity, demographic, age, et cetera. Um, and finally, I think uh, to note, uh, traditional risk factors like GAL and um, triacruzic risk scores were also collected when it was available, um, but it wasn't available all the time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what are the key characteristics of this data set? Um, so one, a lot of patients, so uh, about 120, well, 115,000 patients, uh, fairly mean and median averages. So again, uh, in their 50s and 60s, um, lots of screening mammograms, diagnostic mammograms, uh, annual rate of being 10.6, which is, I believe, about the same level as a national average, or maybe a little bit higher, I think. Um, Race-wise, again, the kind of the crux or one of the key points of it is that one, we have 41% uh, African-American and 38% uh, white patients. So this is significantly, I guess, more diverse than a lot of the data sets out there. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that many of the other uh, races and ethnic uh, demographics. But again, we have 6.5 Asian, uh, Pacific Highlander, multiple, and Indian. Um, Ethnicity-wise, again, I think it's fairly common. Um, among the U.S. population, or at least in our area, um, and cancer rates as well. Hi, um, Jason. Uh, yeah. In terms of uh, number of patients, uh, can you explain this annual recall rate? Um, annual recall rate. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm not familiar yeah. with that. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what the annual recall rate was. I believe that means, um, ooh, you know, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, there's a star, and okay. I don't think I read the star. <laughs> <laughs> and this 3.2% positivity rate is about the same as the other data sets. So because of the nature of the screening exams, you just get a like, uh, very small uh, positivity rate. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So then the key characteristics of the data set. Um, so this is kind of a little graph of uh, the years of follow up. So again, uh, a lot of patients, uh, I believe 37,000 had um, at least a three year follow up. And then 24 or 25,000 had at least five year follow ups. And again, the rate of cancer, or I guess the number of patients with cancer was about 3%, and an annual cancer incidence of 1.6%. Uh, let's see, characteristics, other characteristics, I guess just by BIRADS category. Um, so again, BIRADS zero, meaning uh, I believe indeterminate. Um, so it's kind of screwed. 
well, these are the numbers I should say. I, I won't read them all out loud. Uh, by res one, which is, I believe, normal. Uh, by res two being abnormal. And then three, four, five, six, all of them being kind of, again, abnormal. Uh, let's see. And then this is kind of a pathological outcome of the region of the interest. So again, for all of the RRIs, there is uh, invasive, well, again, the four, or I should say seven, uh, the seven types that we categorize it as, we mapped all of the RRIs correctly. Um, okay, let's see. And then some other things, um, the full data set is 16 terabytes, so that's a lot. It's stored in a MongoDB database hosted um, in, I believe, in the Emory uh, servers. But there is a 20% um, that are publicly available through Amazon, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, the images are, you know, D are given as either dnn5.com files or 16-bit image PNG files. Um, and you can just kind of search through them in the database. And the file names were hashed so that you can directly um, link it to its DICOM metadata. Um, I will mention that uh, some of the limitations is that one, uh, only 20% or sorry, about 20% of the lesions were classified as ambiguous. Um, ambiguous meaning uh, we didn't know how to map the report to the specific uh, ROI. So a lot of the patients, again, about 80% uh, of the ROIs, the patient only had one uh, ROI. As, and so when we look at the reports, we could clearly do a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, unfortunately, um, some of the patients had multiple uh, ROIs. And so if there was one report that said, you know, here's two lesions that are suspicious. It was kind of very difficult to go from the the text part to the actual um, to specify which ROI the report was talking about. Um, there were some methods discussed about how you know there's sometimes the report will say it is in the nine o'clock direction um, that is you know, the furthest out from the center or there's like different categories. But again, um, those were pretty inconsistent and we didn't have time to kind of fully validate it before we released the data set. Um, the metadata, we limited it to um, the metadata that's present in at least 10% of the files. Um, one of the reasons why we did that was that some of the DICOM files um, were actually corrupted. Uh, and so the manufacturer and model uh, keys or tags were corrupted. And so that actually generated like ex extra 2000 um, metadata tags for each file. So again, um, if we have those um, random, I guess, errors, then we didn't want to include that. So we just used the 10%. Um, there was also some um, pre-processing that was applied based on the manufacturer. So again, um, some of the images looked low contrast or washed out because of the difference in uh, window leveling between GE and holistic. Um, and so we do some pre-processing. Uh, I believe um, holistic was uh, used in uh, min-max uh, windowing, and then GE was just uh, windowed through the metadata information. Um, how much time did it take for data cleaning? Uh, any tentative measure? Um, I don't remember. Uh, I it it took at least six months to a year, at least for me, because that was I was on the imaging side. So I would say that's how long it took overall. Um, validating it and making sure it was correct. I think it took another couple, like a month or two. Um, yeah, and then. How ROI size being selected? Yeah, I mean, thankfully, um, well, thankfully or not, thankfully, uh, we had a lot of time at the time, or I didn't have too much 
uh, going on. So I had a lot of time to focus on it, but um, yeah, it, it, it did take a long time. Um, it almost seemed like, I mean, we had a running joke in our um, lab meetings at Hitty that every week we'll say, oh, we'll get this done next week. And that happened for about a year. So, yeah. Okay, and then um, finally, one of the, uh, I guess a big limitation again is uh, that the ground truth for the pathologic diagnosis um, relied on the pathology report, or I guess the specimen being obtained at Emory. So again, um, if it was not obtained at the Emory itself, again, we had four institutions. One of them was a inner city uh, institution that we had collaborations with. Um, we technically couldn't use those ground truths because it wasn't obtained at Emory. Okay. And okay, so finally, um, I told you guys how great this data set is and hopefully you kind of understand like how or the amount of work it took to um, get this data set. And so how can you access it? Uh, one, uh, we ha do have an Amazon Web Services open data program. So if you go to this link, um, you can just access 20% of the data and this 20% is the 20% of the total 2D and C view data sets. So again, it comes with all of those images as well as all the reports and metadata uh, available for it. And if you do want to actually um, have access to the full data set, um, we do have collaboration and um, either through research or industry partners that are reviewed on a case by case basis. Um, there is a Google link um, to figure out if you can uh, access it. And otherwise, um, easiest would be either contacting me or Dr. Hari Trevetti. Um, I say contact Hari because I'm going to forward your email to him anyway. So um, yeah. And outside of that, um, yeah, I think that's it. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hello, Jason. Uh, is this like in you most of the thing, uh, what are most of the images you use in 2D, right? Yes, most of the images are 2D. Um, actually, so uh, the the twenty percent available again are 2D and C view, and again, C view is a synthetic 2D, um, and it doesn't impl include actually the uh, DBT ultrasound or MRI exams that may be available f for some patients. So. Um, my question, what's the scope of registration? Is there any scope of registration in your application? Is there any deformation you find it in your uh, different cities? Uh, I guess I'm not understanding what you mean by scope. Um, uh, no, uh, have you, in your pipeline, do you have any registration, email registration? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think you're talking about kind of like the RI extraction, correct? I think uh, ROI uh, const uh, construction, you used it for any, any model for this kind of segmentation model or just in manual? Yeah, so um, we use an efficient debt B3. So it's kind of like a efficient at B0, but it's a detection model um, that's, I believe, publicly available. So we use that as the actual uh, ROI, I guess, detection slash localization model. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you know any sorts of research training of certain models or evaluation of pre-existing models or exploratory data analysis done on this data set yet? Uh, yes. Um, I believe there's already, uh, if you go to the HIDI website, actually, we do have a list uh, list of data, or I guess projects being run. And we do have data, or I guess papers published already um, about the, or uh, using this data. Um, I think internal, uh, I can't really say exactly which ones because um, I remember it's like the internal uh, lab meetings. So I'm not sure if, if the paper has been published yet or not, but yes, I believe there are a bunch. And actually, um, I actually found out about this this morning. Uh, there's actually a RSNA, uh, I believe, mammography challenge. And I believe um, 
the embed data set is either part of the internal or even the external uh, validation data set. Great. Um, I guess thanks so much, Jason. I'll, I'll, I guess before we like, spend a few more minutes on questions, let's thank Jason for this wonderful talk and then the amount of effort that you know, clearly has gone into releasing this data set. Um, so great job. And, and yeah, uh, do people have more questions? Oh, I actually had one. So uh, do you have any supporting um, I don't know, code base or, or something to access like the Amazon Web Services, like the 20% data, like um, how much like proprietary, like sh should we think about DICOM extraction and all of that um, from the user side or is there some kind of a central repo that you guys have already created that people can use? Uh, I believe we do have some like internally um, and, I, and I believe that's actually, the code is actually open source. so. Um, if you actually go to, uh, I believe Emery Hitty um, as the GitHub, um, you should be able to find it. Um, that's where you can find actually the Niffler code that extracted all of the DICOMs. Uh, otherwise, as far as I remember, or I think is is still the state right now, um, you can just use uh, essentially all of the images uh, are linked with the metadata, so um, there's no like crazy lookup table as long as you can kind of mess around with pandas essentially um it's fairly straightforward got it and i'm just curious um like even to do all this um like kind of when you mentioned the efficient um net to kind of extract the rois how much compute did you need to like basically process this 16 tb of data and what was the compute requirements, even if it's like not not the ultimate um, classification task or, or segmentation task? Right, that's a great question. Um, I don't remember exactly how many compute power we had. Um, I believe we had a few A100s. Um, everything was kind of done in parallel and this specific like uh, efficient debt training um, was actually run by another collaborator of ours. Um, so I don't exactly remember how long it took, but I do know like just extracting all of them. We actually had to do it in 10% batches um, or yeah, 10% batches. And so we did it in chunks and I believe that took at least a few months if I remember correctly. Got it. And this was just running inference, right? Like you were not training the model or anything. Yeah, we actually extracted a few, um, excuse me, um, purely, I guess, like manually annotated ones. Um, I do remember kind of going through the actual, uh, what is it? Going through the actual uh, screen saves and kind of manually annotating a bunch of them so that we could use it as a uh, ground truth for this efficient that training. Got it. Okay. And I guess out of curiosity, have you tried playing around with any of these, um, you know, segment anything modules or like, like, like all of these open source, uh, new generative, like, do they work for mammograms? Do you have any sense of whether, you know, like they can actually identify such small calcifications or, or something like that? Uh, I believe so. Um... <laughs> This was probably a couple of years ago, but uh, one of the, I mean, our former lab members, uh, uh, Sophie, um, she, I believe, did a project with the Emory data set um, doing calcification segmentation. Um, and so I believe essentially, um, uh, let's see if I go back to one of the mammogram images. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know if this is actually true or not, but if there was like essentially a calcification running like this, um, again, that was a data set that was also manually curated, but if there was a calcification that ran through the breast, she actually trained models um, to segment these, uh, I guess, calcifications across the breast. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, 
Let's see, we have a comment in the chat. Yeah, that was the RSNA one. Yep. And I believe our data set was part of it. I don't know if it was for internal or external, but um, it's involved, I should say. Awesome. So I guess the next big thing is to create a benchmark on your data set so that you know people can start testing different things. Is that something yep. that you're thinking about? Yeah, actually, um, maybe I'm trying to go back to the slides. Uh, okay, there we go. So Judy here, um, I guess it's kind of a shameless plug. Um, Judy here, uh, I believe in August, like mid, early to mid August is hosting a datathon. And obviously one of, um, one of what she wants to do is kind of, <laughs> excuse me, in the datathon, allow people to kind of train their models on either mixed synthetic or, you know, biased data sets, and then train whatever models you need to do for whatever task it is, and then have a hidden test set where, you know, if we gave you a data set of all white patients, um, but a test, one of the test sets could be, you know, 50-50 or even all just like black patients. And then just to see, and then we'll kind of give you a, um, like a performance metric based on, uh, the test sets that we have. Um, so if you're interested, uh, I'm sure I could find out the actual website and everything for it, but um, yeah, you guys should come through if you can. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, that actually brought up one question I wanted to ask. So you had mentioned that you have four centers from which you get all your data, right? Mm -hmm. So are, the, are each of the centers, like do they get a, um, like a large portion of African American patients, or are there like um, like, like a few centers that are more heavily African American, but but a few like are the four centers equally distributed, or is there some um, correlation between? Um... Yeah, I think I get what you're saying. Um, as I don't know if we did a specific like breakdown based on institution or I guess the uh, the hospital I should say um, but I believe it was very equal across the board okay. so Emory has uh, obviously multiple institutions there's Emory Midtown there's Emory uh, I guess in Emory the original Emory uh, there is uh, Emory St. Joe uh, and then I believe the fourth one was at Grady which is also in downtown Atlanta um, all of it is within the metropolitan area of Atlanta. And so they all kind of see the same, similar number of populations. Um, if I were to make a bet on it, I would assume that um, uh, Grady Hospital probably has a slightly higher um, population of black patients, but because it's like downtown, downtown Phoenix. So um, outside of that, I don't think so. Oh, that's great, okay. Yep. Cool. Um, are there any last questions for Jason before we end the session today? Hi, Jason. Uh, you mentioned it's a racially diverse data set. Did you, mean, did you see any difference in data characteristics? For example, let's say the positivity rate among different races. Right. Um, and I'll kind of like, kind of, maybe put Ramon on the spot or like piggyback on Ramon since he's here. Um, we did go through kind of the data set to figure out, I don't know if disease prevalence was different based on the uh, racial, uh, uh, I guess the patient's race, but I believe um, just in general, like the, the breast density um, is different based on uh, your race. So I believe like Asian patients have a, higher average breast density versus uh, white and black patients. Uh, I don't remember if black patients had less or more breast, more dense breast, but uh, yeah, there is, there's things like that. And this breast density information is part of the data set or is it something one can compute uh, through the memory? Yeah, so all of the breast densities should be in the data set. Um, so it'll tell you um, uh, all of the BIRAD scores as well as the breast densities. 
um, racial makeup and all of that information should be in the metadata. Great. So I guess, um, thanks, Jason. Um, this was a great talk. And then I hope everybody like tries to use the data set and then um, can build independent models as well. So I guess we'll see everybody next week. And we'll have the oh. YouTube show up today um, later. And then, um, yeah, have a great rest of the week. And, and I guess, happy 4th of July in advance. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.